Weather in the Vertical, a presentation by Ed Williams. This presentation is brought to you by the Flying Particles Incorporated. The presentation by Ed Williams is copyright 2008 by Ed Williams, all rights reserved. The production by LBMG Music is copyright 2008 by LBMG Music, all rights reserved. Hope you enjoy this presentation of Weather in the Vertical. And now, our speaker. So last week we talked about the uh, influence of uh, the uh, temperature profile on the atmospheric conditions, on whether the air is stable or unstable, and whether that leads to uh, um, the kind of clouds you get, the gustiness of the winds, the visibilities, etc. So that information is plotted on uh, charts called uh, skew T diagrams. And uh, we'll be looking at a particular version of this, which is available on the website uh, on the slide, rucsoundings.noaa.gov. This is an interactive plotter, and we'll learn that it's um, rather more convenient to use than the old uh, graph paper that uh, was used for many years. So on these plots, one finds the uh, temperature. Here you one sees uh, on the right, the temperature is plotted in red. Going upwards is uh, altitude, and to the left of that is the dew point. To remind you, the dew point is the temperature to which you cool a sample of air to make it saturated. So if the air was totally saturated in the first place, the temperature would equal the dew point. If the uh, air is relatively dry, then uh, the dew point will be significantly less than the temperature because it takes a lot of cooling to bring it to saturation. As I said, the vertical axis of this plot is uh, the altitude. Um, they're shown by the blue horizontal lines and labeled on the right. It's uh, 1, 5, 10, 15, 20,000 feet. And labeled on the left by the corresponding pressure. So these altitudes are, strictly speaking, pressure altitudes, what you'd obtain by setting your altimeter to 2992 and reading it. Then. Uh, the horizontal axis is temperature, and those you'll see plotted along the bottom, uh, minus 40 up through plus 40, except the constant temperature lines slant off to the right, and so that's why it's referred to as a skew T plot. We'll see this in a little more detail in a second. So if you go to the website that we referred to, the rucsoundings.noaa.gov, um, the opening page you'll see here on this slide um, you're presented with a screen on which you get to choose the data source and the time of which you want the observation or the forecast. So uh, at the top, there's a bewildering list of choices. Um, the one I would recommend using uh, for normal purposes is uh, labeled there as OP20. Uh, it's uh, a forecast on a 13-kilometer uh, grid, for some reason interpolated onto a 20-kilometer grid whereas the default is that same forecast interpolated onto a coarser mesh, onto a 40-kilometer grid. So one is able to get uh, this, this forecast information, which we'll talk about. You, you can also get observations. Uh, Ray OBS, they're shown there, uh, the sixth one down. Those are the um, uh, balloon observations uh, that are obtained by uh, sending up weather balloons and having them telemeter down. The, uh, the temperature and dew point and uh, location from which they get wind. And uh, these are sent up uh, every 12 hours at 00 and 1200 Zulu. So um, uh, those are good if it happens to be 00 or 1200 Zulu, but if it's somewhere in between, then the forecast will give you more timely information. So then below you get to choose uh, the time, uh, which would normally be now. So then uh, checking the box where it says latest will do that, or you can specify the specific time in the boxes on the right. And then below that, the uh, number of times, if you want to forecast how many hours out into the future, like uh, a series of forecasts. And at the bottom, a uh, box in which you can enter the list of locations. So these can be the um, sites at which there are Rayob observations, if you're looking at Rayobs or it can be a list of airports. If um, uh, you're looking at the forecast, it knows mo where most airports are. And even in principle, you can put in uh, 
latitude, longitude pairs if um, you want some obscure place where there's no airport. So uh, these forecasts are made by um, uh, a computer model called the rapid update cycle. That's what the RUC stands for. And the rapid update cycle means that the computer model is started with new initial conditions every hour on the hour. Each hour, it incorporates the data that's come into the Weather Bureau during that hour, either in the form of uh, ray obs, which only come in every 12 hours, or um, surface observations like the METARs and uh, satellite data. And so, um, since it's been constantly updated, um, it pretty much represents the truth at the time that the model has started, and if you don't run it very far, it probably doesn't get very far off. So this is probably the best source of uh, data that you can get into the short range. Um, that's a lot of forecasts to be starting a computer model every hour. So in fact, how long they run the, uh, the computer depends on uh, the hour of the day, and it's quite complicated, and I certainly don't need to memorize this, but it's right there on the slide. Uh, for a, a Zulu time that's not divisible by three, in other words, initial times that are one, two, four, five, seven, eight, etc., uh, Greenwich Mean Time, the uh, forecast is only run for three hours. So you get projections at starting time one, two, three hours in advance. However, every third hour, that is at 0, 0, 0, 0003, 0, 06, 0, 09, they run the forecast out longer, out to 6, 9, and 12 hours from the initial point. And then every sixth hour, so that's at 0, 0, 0, 006, 12, and 1800 Zulu, they uh, run the forecasts, giving you additional outputs at 24 and 36 hours from the starting point. So these soundings give us a great deal of information about the local weather, where the sounding is, or is forecast to be. In particular, it will tell us about cloud layers, the bases and tops. We'll learn this in a second. Uh, the winds aloft are plotted on there. We can infer information about possible icing, possible turbulence, uh, the stability of the atmosphere, potential for fog, thunderstorms, and other hazardous weather. And as I said, the, uh, the air data is based on these worldwide uh, balloon rayob observations, which are input to numerical codes to then produce hourly predictions thereafter. So looking at the plot in a little more detail, as I mentioned when we saw this the first time, the uh, vertical axis is uh, pressure altitude. The uh, horizontal axis, you can see the red lines tilting to the right, are the uh, lines of constant temperature. That's why it's referred to as a skew T. And uh, it's done in this rather strange manner because uh, if the axis was done in the normal way where uh, zero degrees C just represent the point that went up vertically from the bottom of the axis, since the temperature always decreases as you go up in, the, in altitude, every plot would disappear off at about 45 degree angle to the left and take up a lot more graph paper. By tilting the axes over, the, um, uh, the soundings are roughly vertical and uh, easier to read. So we, as we see on the next plot, if we plot the standard atmosphere, we can see it in fact slopes uh, slightly to the left in the uh, troposphere. That's up to just over 35,000 feet. Once you enter the stratosphere, the temperature becomes constant on a standard day, minus 56 C. This standard atmosphere is just a uh, reference used for uh, aircraft performance purposes so that uh, there's some definite atmospheric condition you can refer to, but in any given location on any given day, it's extremely unlikely that the atmosphere actually is standard. It'll be different to this. So this is what a standard atmosphere would look like if you ever got one. And it is a temperature of 15 degrees Celsius at sea level decreasing 2 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet up to the tropopause. That's where the break in the curve is. So the temperature becomes constant, minus 56. So on these plots, we have the temperature and the dew point. Temperature in red, the dew point in blue. And uh, the first thing of interest is to look at the spread. 
where the temperature and dew point are close together, you can anticipate a cloud layer. In particular, if the temperature and dew point are equal, you know that the uh, air is either was or was predicted to be completely saturated at that level. And if the air is saturated, you'd expect to see a cloud there. However, the uh, sounding can have somewhat unsaturated air and yet still have still have clouds present and that's because these uh, plots represent the conditions averaged over a 20 kilometer square and so if you had say broken clouds at some altitude uh, some of the air will be saturated where the clouds are and in the gaps in between it's not and so when averaged over that entire layer the air is less than saturated so the gap, the different, the temperature dew point depression will be a measure of whether the air, whether the clouds are overcast, broken, scattered, or no clouds at all. So in this particular example, you can see that the temperature and dew point flows together at an altitude of 8,000 feet. And that, in fact, corresponds to the METAR at the same time. You can see that this uh, forecast on the bottom left says it's for 0, 100 Zulu on the 27th and uh, corresponding uh, METAR is right there for 0, 0, 0057, 0, 0, 0055 Zulu where it's uh, 330 at 11 knots, 20 miles visibility, 8,000 overcast. So in this case, that layer at 8,000 feet was in fact overcast. So the temperature dew point depression then at a given altitude um, gives you a measure of uh, the clouds you might expect there. And uh, if that dew point depression, temperature minus dew point, is zero, then you can expect the clouds to be overcast. At the surface, you'd call it fog. If that dew point depression is one or two degrees C, then the expectation is that the clouds will be broken. If that dew point depression is three to five degrees Celsius, then you have scattered or few clouds. However, this is a little bit inexact. Uh, the actual spread of dew point depressions depends somewhat on the temperature. In fact, at very cold temperatures below uh, minus 25 C, then you can have clouds even associated with temperature dew point depressions of 6 or 7 degrees C. Conversely, near the surface, when the temperatures are high, you may require somewhat smaller dew point depressions to get the same amount of clouds. Now, these considerations apply to stratus-type clouds and stable air. If the air is stable, then if you have a cloud, the cloud just sits there. If the air is unstable, then the potential is that cloud can build upwards into the drier air above. And so just because on the sounding the temperature dew point depression is large doesn't necessarily mean there's no cloud there. Potentially, there could be a cumulus cloud that built up from below. And we'll see how that works in a minute. If it's actually precipitating, raining or snowing, then as far as these um, skew T's are concerned, the temperature dew point spread will be low even if there are gaps between the clouds. So you could have a situation where you had some clouds near the ground, a gap in which it's raining from clouds above, and then, then the clouds above, but there wouldn't be any fine distinction between the bases of the upper clouds and the precipitation below. It all looks saturated as far as the uh, UT can tell. Estimating the cloud uh, bases and tops from a temperature dew point sounding may be quite simple or more difficult depending on how well defined they are. Uh, here I'm going to give you some rules of thumb that were developed by the uh, Air Force. First of all, a cloud base is almost always found in a layer as indicated on the sounding where the dew point depression, that is the difference between the temperature and the dew point, decreases. The dew point depression usually decreases to between 0 and 6 degrees Celsius when a cloud is associated with a decrease. In other words, we should not always associate a cloud with a layer of dew point decrease but only when the decrease leads to a minimum dew point depression of less than 6 degrees Celsius. With the possible exception that a 
cold enough temperatures below minus 25 C, uh, dew point depressions and clouds can be reported as greater than 6 degrees C. The dew point depression in a cloud is on average smaller at higher temperatures. Typical dew point depressions are 1 or 2 degrees Celsius at temperatures of 0 degrees Celsius and above, and maybe 4 degrees Celsius between minus 10 and minus 20 Celsius. On the uh, sounding, we see two areas there where uh, there are potential cloud layers. There are relatively sharp decreases in the uh, uh, temperature dew point depression, and uh, uh, both of them will be associated with, uh, we'd expect to be associated with clouds. Here's some more details on estimating the tops and bases. In this particular case, the uh, tops and bases are very well defined by the sounding. Um, in general, if the base of a cloud uh, should be located at the base of the layer of decreasing dew point depression, provided that decrease is sharp. If a layer of decrease of dew point depression is followed by a layer of stronger decrease, then the cloud base should be identified with the base of the layer of the strongest decrease. Uh, conversely, the tops, the top of the cloud layer is usually indicated by an increase in dew point depression. Once a cloud base is determined, the cloud is assumed to be extend, is assumed to extend up to the level where a significant increase in dew point depression starts. The gradual increase of dew point depression within the cloud with height uh, is not significant. So not only can we guess the um uh, locations of the clouds, we can actually guess their bases and tops. So on this next uh, view graph, we have a situation where we have um, a cloud layer, and I've drawn two arrows to the base where the temperature and the dew point first meet, and the top where they start to split apart. And we'll learn shortly that um, because the temperature curve is tilting off to the right, that means it's going to be stable there, so we have a stable cap. So the tops really are tops, the uh, clouds won't build up above that. And so reading off the, uh, the skew T, we see the bases should be around 2,000 feet and the tops look to be about 6. And now we can read the uh, pilot report and the METAR for the corresponding time, both of them around 1900. The uh, pilot report was 11 minutes later. The city was over Corvallis in a Cessna 210, and he experienced uh, cloud conditions broken 3,000, top 6,000. That's pretty close to what we estimated from the skew T. And the actual METAR for Corvallis five minutes earlier was 10 miles visibility and 3,900 broken. So, slight discrepancy, the airport wasn't ex exactly where the airplane was, it was also, also wasn't exactly the same time, it was 15 minutes later, but um, both of them in substantial agreement with the uh, skew T. One thing you'll also notice is at the top, uh, on the right, where you see all the wind arrows, where you see the wind speed and direction, you see there's a significant shift in the wind direction. That's actually quite common as you go from one stable... Uh, air mass to an air mass of different character. There's often a wind shift there associated with some kind of front. So if you're interested in cloud tops, um, you can look at all the individual uh, skew T's, but there are dedicated products that uh, produce cloud top heights. One way of measuring them is to look down at them from uh, above with uh, geostationary satellites looking at the infrared radiation. And uh, those can distinguish moisture from uh, dry air and the temperature gives an indication of the uh, height. And so uh, translated into color scale on the bottom is the top of the clouds in, uh, on a pressure scale of millibars. So you then have to go back to the previous slide to turn those millibars and altitude that you can use unless you have the table memorized. And here we see a movie of uh, another product, the uh, cloud tops from the rapid update cycle simulation data, that's the same stuff that goes into the METARs. 
uh, with additional satellite and pilot report data. And uh, this I find a little bit more usable, though it's a it's an experimental site, so you'll have to use the um, the pointer given there, and it may or may not work uh, sometime in the future. So to remind you uh, from earlier, we were concerned about whether the atmosphere was stable, unstable, or in between, what's called uh, conditionally unstable. And this was determined, if you recall, by the ambient lapse rate, the rate at which the temperature decreases with altitude, that's the ambient lapse rate, compared to a theoretical number, the adiabatic lapse rate, that's the rate at which a parcel would cool if it was lifted. So here we show uh, altitude versus temperature. And uh, the two dashed lines on here are the two adiabatic lapse rates. The one that uh, is more vertical, falls off more slowly, is the, um, the moist adiabatic lapse rate. That's because moist air cools more slowly when you lift it because the moisture condenses and the latent heat uh, heats up the remaining uh, air. The steeper curve going more steeply to the left is the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So then the three sample soundings, the green one, the yellow one, the red one, the green sounding, where the temperature is uh, to the right of both adiabatic lapse rates, is stable. And so uh, lifted air here, um, it would cool adiabatically, end up colder than its surroundings, and so it would sink back down again. The red curve is the opposite situation where the temperature is falling more rapidly than the dry adiabatic lapse rate. So here, if you lifted some air, its temperature would be warmer than the surrounding air, so it would continue to rise. So this is a situation that you can't sustain for any length of time because uh, the air near the surface wants to keep rising and mix with the cooler air above, driving the uh, lapse rate back towards the adiabatic one. So in practice, these Completely unstable soundings are only found close to the surface in the desert in the summer where there's a lot of heating from below. The most common situation, and the one that is most interesting from the weather point of view, is where we have a lapse rate that is in between the two adiabatic lapse rates. That is, uh, falling off faster than the moist adiabatic rate, but falling off slower than the dry adiabatic rate. This is said to be conditionally unstable. It is stable as long as the air remains dry. But if by some mechanism, either by lifting the air, cooling it, or uh, adding moisture to it, you make it saturated, then it is unstable. So if you lift it to the point where it becomes saturated, then, uh, then it'll continue rising. So uh, little diagrams on the right, the stable uh, marble, push it to one side, it'll roll back to the middle. Unstable marble, if doesn't matter how small amount you push it, it'll fall off. Conditionally stable, you have to push it up a hill, but once you've pushed it far enough, then it'll fall off. That's your conditionally unstable situation. So these uh, adiabats are shown on the skew t plot. So the uh, sort of orangey ones are the uh, moist adiabats, curved, highly curved. The uh, almost straight ones, the blue ones going off to the left, are the uh, dry adiabats. And so uh, we can use this uh, skew t chart like a little computer. We can have it tell us what happens to a parcel if we lift it. So if we start with a parcel at 800 millibars and a temperature of 20 degrees C, that's where the circle is on the plot. And first, let's assume it's dry. It's dry, and we lift it we lift it up to the 600 millibar level, then it'll follow a dry adiabat, and so it'll end up at the tip of the blue arrow. And we can read off the temperature that it'll end up at by following the red arrow down to the temperature scale. Apparently, it will cool down from 10 degrees to about minus 12. On the other hand, if that same parcel of moisture was moist, that is, it's totally saturated, then when you lift it, it'll uh, go up on the orange curve. At the 600 millibar level, it'll end up at the tip of the orange curve. And we read that off down the red arrow 
it would cool down to only minus 2. So you can see there's a considerable difference if you uh, lift moist air, the temperature drops 12 degrees. That same air was dry, the temperature lops, uh, drops uh, 22 degrees. So in reality, some parcel is probably partially, uh, has some moisture, but is not totally saturated. And so if we continue to lift it, initially as we lift it, it will cool on the dry adiabat, and it'll continue cooling on that curve until it becomes saturated. Once the lifted parcel becomes saturated, then from that point on, it will remain, uh, remain saturated, and its uh, trajectory on this uh, skew T plot will follow the uh, moist adiabat. So the pur purple curve here represents a parcel that starts at sea level with a temperature that looks like about minus, that's uh, probably plus 37. If you lift it, getting up to around 620 millibars, it's cooled down to just below freezing and it becomes saturated. Then as you continue to lift it, it continues up the, the purple curve. So um, this can clearly be done by hand, uh, drawing in the lines following uh, these curves on the plot. That is somewhat intricate work. The, um, the skew T plot provided on that RUC soundings, the site does it automatically. If you click anywhere on the left click anywhere on the chart, it'll draw the purple line telling you what a parcel, starting from the point where you clicked, what its temperature would be as you lifted it up in altitude. So that leaves one question, which is, well, how do you know at what point the moisture parcel becomes, the parcel of air becomes saturated when you lift it? Where does that uh, curve kink from leaving the dry adiabat onto the moist one? Well, that must depend on how much moisture it started with. If it started with uh, a lot of moisture, it was almost saturated, then you'd only have to lift it a little bit in altitude, and then it would become saturated. Conversely, if it started off relatively dry, you'd have to lift it a long way. And so it's determined by the dew point at the, the dew point of the parcel, at the point from which you lift it. And that's the, what the purpose of the remaining gray lines on the chart tilting to the right. They are lines of constant uh, mixing ratio, constant mixture of moisture to air. And they, are, they represent how the dew point changes as you lift the parcel. parcel. So in this instance, we're taking our parcel. It's starting off with a temperature of 25 degrees. Dew point is minus 4. The dew point follows the black arrow, paralleling the gray curves on the chart. The temperature follows the purple curve, following the dry adiabats. When they meet, then the temperature and the dew point have met. So at that point, the air is saturated. So from that point on, the curve continues the um, longer moist adiabat. So if we look at this, uh, if we click on the plot, in this case a surface parcel, then we can immediately tell whether that air is stable or unstable. If the purple line is to the left of the red one, that is the, the lifted temperature is colder than the ambient temperature, then we know if you lifted the parcel it would be colder, it would be more dense, so it would sink back down. So if the purple line is to the left of the red one, it's a stable situation. Conversely, if the purple line drifts to the right of the uh, temperature curve, the red one, and it must have been unstable. So on the next uh, view graph, we see um, an example of an unstable profile, a very unstable one. This was a uh, profile taken at uh, 0, 100 Zulu at Jackson, Tennessee, MKL on this date. And um, about 30 minutes later, they had a tornado go through the town. So it must have been unstable. How do we tell that? Well, if we click on the surface parcel, we can see the purple line come up, and we can see there's a large range of altitudes between oh, 800 millibars up to about 200 millibars, where such a lifted parcel would be considerably warmer than the environment. And so if you give a parcel near the surface a little bit of a kick up to the 900 millibar level, then from then on it'll keep on rising. 
Well, that's what gives you the uh, large vertical development you see in a, in a thunderstorm, a, a r wide range of altitude where the air is potentially unstable. The area between the uh, temperature curve and the lifted parcel curve, that is between the red one and the purple one, or the purple one is to the right, that area is a measure of how much energy a uh, lifted parcel will get by the, from the buoyancy forces. Now we can see this because at any given altitude, the difference in temperature between the, uh, the parcel and the ambient temperature is a measure of the difference in density, so it's a measure of the buoyancy force. Just like uh, the amount of lift a balloon has depends on the difference between the temperature of the air inside its envelope to the air outside. So the lift force is proportional to this difference. The uh, vertical axis is height, so uh, the area in here is force times height, which is uh, work, and so uh, this is a direct uh, measure of the energy. And uh, so it's got a name that suggests that. This area is called the CAPE, or the Convective Available Potential Energy. And they calculate it for you. They put it on the right-hand side of the plot, right at the top. In this case, the Convective Available Potential Energy was uh, 3,915 joules per kilogram. So uh, the bigger this number is, the more unstable the air is. And uh, as a rule of thumb, it's been found that if the cape is between 0 and 1,000, that's sort of marginally unstable. 1,000 to 2,500, moderate. 2,500 to 3,500, very. And 3,500 plus, extremely unstable. So we're in the extreme category here. And uh, so we're not too surprised when we got uh, tornadoes. So there's, one, there's some other interesting things here, which is, well, I've got this parcel at the surface. Initially, if I lift it, you can see the purple line as it starts off just slightly to the left of the red line. So that initial lifting um, uh, requires some force. Something has to come along and do it. So um, you could have a cold front, or there could be just some region on the ground which is a little bit warmer than the average temperature here, and therefore the curve would be further over to the right. Um, or there could be some mechanical lifting. There could be a range of hills that, uh, with the wind, prevailing winds, help lift the air up to the point where it becomes unstable, where the, where the purple curve first goes to the right of the red one. So that point is called the level of free convection, LFC here. That's also um, calculated for you on the right-hand side. So that tells you basically how, how much lifting you have to provide in order to trigger the instability. And so if you see a bunch of little cumulus clouds down there at low level, but you've got this extremely high cape, then you know that if those cumulus clouds have ever punched through the, the um, level of free convection, then they'll just keep on going up, and they'll go up at least to the point where the temperature and dew point meet again, which is called the equilibrium level. So that's up here at about 200 millibars. And it's shown on the right, 196 millibars, to be more precise. So in an unstable profile, then in general, starting from the, the surface, your purple line will start off to the left of the, uh, the um, temperature profile and then uh, go to the right of it. Where it's the left, the air is stable. Where it's the right, it's unstable. Two areas, the unstable area we said was called the cape. That's the convective available potential energy. The other area is important. It's called the convective inhibition, CIN. That gives you a measure of how much energy the lifting processes have to provide in order to trigger the thunderstorm. So the smaller that is, the less it's going to take. In this particular example, uh, where we're in Rapid City, the convective inhibition is quite high. And so, um, say, well, that doesn't look too bad. But in fact, out to the west, there's a cold front. And a few hours later, that cold front came through, wedged the air up near the surface, lifting it through this convective inhibition, and triggered a bunch of thunderstorms, despite the initially low cape. The skew T log P plot that we've been looking at is also a great tool to check on potential icing conditions. 
And if you recall, you can get structural icing on the uh, on your airframe if the temperature of the airplane is below freezing, which normally requires the outside air temperatures to be above freezing since they uh, pretty much equilibrate, and visible moisture in the atmosphere, that is either a cloud, little tiny moisture droplets, or precipitation. That moisture can then stick to the uh, airplane and build up on it as a layer of structural ice. So the SKU-T is a great tool because it's got both both the, the, all the information we need. It's got the freezing levels, so where the outside air temperatures are above freezing, we should not expect any icing conditions. Where it's below freezing, then we have the, that potential as long as there's moisture. The SKU-T also shows the possibility of multiple freezing levels. If you go to an area forecast or many of the freezing level graphics, they'll just give you one number for the freezing level. Let's say the freezing level is 3,000 feet. What they mean by that is the lowest freezing level is 3,000 feet. And they won't say whether there's more than one. And more than one we'll find is important because that makes freezing rain a possibility where you can get severe icing. So here's a, um, a uh, skew T plot that um, I found that corresponded to a current uh, icing pilot report. So uh, the pilot reported that uh, he was over Eugene. Uh, he is actually the Eugene 160 radial at 15 miles at 0107 Zulu at 10,000 feet. He was in a beach 99. Temperature was minus 7. And he experienced moderate clear icing. So we're looking at the skew T for Eugene at 0000, 000, 000, 000 Zulu. So that's um, oh an hour earlier, but uh, presumably didn't change much. And uh, the red curve is the temperature. And where it's to the left of the black line, which I've drawn in, is the zero degree isotherm. Everywhere above that altitude, so that's above about uh, 4,000 feet, is below freezing. Uh, so we have the potential for icing as long as there is um, potential for clouds. And, well, you might say, well, the temperature dew point spread here is actually... Um, somewhat small, around eight or 900 millibars, so it might be clouds there, but then they widen apart. And uh, so uh, if you weren't careful, you might conclude there's only clouds down around 800 millibars, but that's not true because you should check for the instability. We click on the, uh, at the base of the temperature, and we'll draw the parcel trajectory from the surface. And we'll see the purple line actually is just slightly to the right of the red one. So as seen here, everywhere between, oh, 900 feet up to, sorry, 900 millibars up to about 600 millibars, uh, the air is unstable. So clouds that form at the lower level potentially grow up to here. So we'd expect cumulus-type clouds then between um, 900 millibars or about 3,000 feet up to, uh, where the purple line leaves the red one, that's around 14,000 feet. And cumulus-type clouds and uh, below freezing temperatures, uh, you can associate with uh, some kind of clear icing. Well, that's all consistent. Um, he uh, got moderate clear icing at uh, 10,000 feet, right in the middle of this layer that we're discussing. On the next plot, uh, we have a sounding that uh, we'll discover indicates uh, freezing rain. So on the left, we have uh, the full skew T plot going all the way up from the surface up to um, 150 millibars. Um, but if you uh, draw a box with your uh, mouse on the skew T, you can zoom in on any portion you want. And we're interested in the lower levels here. So on the right is the, the zoom. And we see that the temperature and dew point are pretty much glued together up to uh, an altitude of about 22,000 feet. So we've got uh, high humidity all the way up here, cloud layer or possibly just precipitation. It's hard to tell. 
up above 22,000, then the um, temperature and dew point split quite rapidly. The uh, temperature goes off to the right, indicating that it's stable. So you've got a stable cap on whatever clouds might be here. If we look at the tops of these clouds, then we can run down and read off the temperature. It's about minus 22. And uh, we'll learn in a minute that uh, the cloud tops are below about minus 10. Then you'd expect precipitation to be snow rather than freezing drizzle. So we've got a deep layer of uh, cold clouds here, which are producing precipitation probably, and that precipitation will be snow. So the snow will then fall down until it reaches the freezing level, which is where we cross the black line here at an altitude of about 8,000 feet. And the snow will then drop into above freezing air. And so that snow will start to melt. Close to the freezing level, you didn't experience it as wet snow. That's snow that is... Um, uh, that won't stick to the uh, wings or um, tail, but could uh, clog up your air intake um, as a sort of uh, as wet snowballs. Well, the snow will eventually melt. How fast it melts depends on just how much warmer the atmosphere is than uh, than the atmosphere above. But roughly speaking, a thousand, twelve hundred feet or so, uh, that wet snow layer will turn into rain. So then we have rain down from six, 7,000 feet, dropping down to where the temperature now drops below freezing again at an altitude of about 5,000 feet. Between 5,000 feet and the surface, we can see the temperature is below freezing. And so we have rain dropping down into below freezing air, uh, which is the recipe for freezing rain. So if we look at the... Uh, Metas from below, we've got a series of them uh, at uh, 1337, 1326, 1252 Zulu, all around this time of this 1300 sounding, and they report uh, respectively light freezing rain, freezing rain, and light freezing rain. Freezing drizzle, drizzle mostly, frequently at least, occurs when the entire stratus cloud is below freezing. So here we're looking at a skew T plot uh, indicating freezing drizzle. And uh, we'll see how we infer this. First of all, the temperature and the dew point are glued together between about uh, 500 feet and about 800 feet. So the air is saturated there. We can expect to see a cloud layer. At the top of the cloud layer, the temperature and the dew point rapidly split. The temperature goes off to the right, indicating a stable cap. And so uh, we will have stratus type clouds. We can confirm this by uh, clicking on, left clicking on the, the uh, parcel at the base. And we'll see our purple line disappearing off to the left of the uh, temperature dew point curves. So it'll be a stratus type cloud. The uh, temperature and dew point are both to the left of the zero degree isotherm. So the temperatures are everywhere below freezing. So we have uh, about 8,000 feet of cloud, quite enough to uh, create precipitation. But when we look at the cloud top temperature, that is the temperature at the point where the temperature of the dew point meet, we read that off on the bottom scale. We see that's about minus uh, 7 degrees C. And that is warmer than the minus 10 degrees C that is necessary to create a significant number of ice crystals in the cloud. Without any ice crystals or somebody flying along with uh, silver iodide and dropping it into the clouds to create uh, to seed them, then uh, the ice crystals, even there aren't any, can't grow. So the moisture remains in the form of supercooled uh, water droplets, which eventually grow by the rather inefficient process of colliding with each other and coalescing. So it's inefficient in the sense that the drops never get very large, so they never fall very fast. You create uh, drizzle drops, tiny drops that are much larger than the drops within clouds, which are much smaller than your typical raindrop, but nevertheless plenty large enough to create significant ice layers on uh, your airplane. 
so inside this uh, cloud then between 500 feet and 800 feet we'd expect to encounter these super cool drizzle droplets uh, these are the uh, these are the conditions that um, crashed the uh, ATR in Roselawn, uh, Illinois, and spawned a whole lot of research that uh, allows us to know more about this than we did before. And it's a counterexample to the uh, often heard uh, rule of thumb that if you encounter freezing precipitation, then climbing will put you in warmer air, will melt it off. In this case, we can see that the temperature never drops below, above, never goes above freezing as you climb. Assume you could climb, you get up into the dry air, but it would never be uh, above freezing. Uh, one last point, we should check that at high altitudes, the uh, temperature and dew point don't come back together again. If they did uh, over a sufficient altitude, then we could create precipitation up at high altitude, which would then, which would be snow because it would be cold. It would fall down into these super cool clouds below. And uh, that snow falling from the clouds above would strip out the super cool moisture below. Here, that's not the case. The air is completely dry above the, uh, the cloud tops. So now we see a uh, skew T characteristic for fog. Fog is just a cloud at ground level, stratus cloud at ground level. So what we uh, would expect to see then would be the temperature of the dew point together all the way to the surface with a uh, stable profile. Here we see the temperature dew point going to the right, which is stable. So uh, fog at the surface, and that is indicated also on the corresponding METAR, 40254, so that's 54 minutes later. There's a quarter mile visibility in light snow and freezing fog. Okay, well, temperature is a little below freezing. Uh, we've got a stable cloud layer, never in fact goes below, uh, uh, goes above freezing. Cloud top temperatures look to be about minus 11, so that's kind of marginal. You know, minus 10 was the dividing line, but it's rather a soft dividing line. So you could get snow, you could get drizzle, and in fact you're sort of getting both. You're getting light snow and freezing fog. Either way, uh, you can expect uh, ice and climb as well as the fog. And now we have a picture of um, a skew T plot corresponding to a uh, mountain wave. Classic uh, mountain wave scenario is where you have a stable band of air above the uh, ridge tops with an adiabatic layer above and below. An adiabatic layer is one where the temperature follows a, a dry adiabatic. So the adiabatic layers are neutrally stable. That is, if I lift some air, it neither wants to rise nor fall. So it's a very, very soft sort of spring. There's no, res no restoring force in either direction. The sta stable layer, on the other hand, has a strong restoring force. So it's like you have two soft springs with a um, stiff string in the middle. Well, if you can set that wiggling, it can wiggle at big amplitude because uh, there's not much to bring it back. So you can set it wiggling by having uh, strong, strong winds blowing approximately perpendicular to the ridge tops. So on the left, we see in cross section the uh, Sierra Nevada. Uh, the winds are from the west. The air gets lifted following these uh, uh, streamlines, and you can see it bounces up and down several times downstream of the uh, mountain range. And it's that bouncing up and down that we experience as a, a mountain wave. So the criteria are then a stable layer above the ridge height, sandwiched between two adiabatic layers. It's also uh, uh, good to have the wind direction not changing significantly to, with height, and also to be uh, approximately perpendicular to the ridge line. So that's just a sample of things that you can learn from the SKU-T. It's a great tool, but you should remember it's not the primary source of weather information. You should go to the traditional sources first, to the METARs, the TAFs, the pilot reports, etc. Then the skew T can be quite valuable to fill in some of the unknowns, for instance, tops, and also to make some assessment of why the forecast is the way, way it is. Um, you should remember that uh, the numerical models don't handle precipitation very well, that um, it's hard to get intermediate 
uh, bands of dry air between two moist layers. It tends to put the precipitation in between. It thinks the whole thing is moist. So although you can get tops and bases, sometimes it's hard to resolve multiple layers if the precipitation is So here are some useful links. You can go to my uh, website where there's a whole bunch of uh, other sources. Uh, there's a meteorologist name is Jeff Habby, who uh, has a whole series of articles on different uh, aspects of weather forecasting and weather, and uh, he has half a dozen of them on different kinds of skew tees. You can go to uh, Chesapeake Aviation Training. Uh, there's a meteorologist there, Scott Denstite, who used to be a uh, research meteorologist, now uh, is trying to make a living as a CFII, makes you wonder. Uh, he offers uh, weekend and net courses on weather. You can go to uh, the University Center for Atmospheric Research. That's the home of the Comet Meteorology, Meteorology Education and Training courses. A lot of interesting modules there. They're all free. And then there are a couple of manuals here, the U.S. Air Force and National Weather Service manuals for UT Log P. Good luck. I tried reading them. They're pretty tough. Um, and if you're uh, mathematically inclined, uh, the algorithms are all there in this uh, last reference. So I would recommend that if you want to use the skew T, then uh, you should practice a bit. When you get a uh, weather forecast, also check the skew T's, see what you conclude from them, go out and fly, see if it actually worked out. And uh, once you've validated that you're actually reading these things in a uh, sensible fashion, then you can start using it to uh, make decisions that have potential consequences.